Vegas took photos. Oh my oh god! My god. Oh, my oh, my god. oh my goodness, guys! Coming to say hello. Oh, might be rolling over. Don't do that. I'm gonna do a little. Oh! oh. Well, we'll come up to breathe. You'll see that big bottom mist, maybe a splash. First off, what type of whale are we looking for? Humpbacks. Humpbacks, yep. They are one of the largest animals that's ever lived. On average, when they're full grown, they'll get about... Conditions offshore, guys, it's such a beautiful day. We've got blue skies, sun shining. We've got a nice west-southwesterly breeze going at the moment, so um, nice and groomed ocean out there. We do have a slight to moderate south swell on the bar, but we've got an incoming tide, so super mellow on the bar as well, guys. That's awesome news. But I will just say, as always, Please just hold on tight and stay seated as we do go through the bar there. The back of the seats are these handles. You guys can just grab onto those. You guys up front here, down here. And just brace any impact that we did happen to take using your knees instead of using your back. It's going to be a lot more comfortable for everybody. I'm going to hand you over to Gab now. She can do a quick safety brief, outline of the cruise, and get moving. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome aboard. My name's Gabrielle. I'll be the marine biologist and crew member taking care of you today. Um, before we get underway, I'll go over a quick safety brief. Looks like you guys figured out the life jacket. Easy design. You want this horseshoe shaped collar around your neck. It goes on like a backpack. One arm through this opening, round the back, arm through the other opening, buckles in the front. So these life jackets are designed to inflate automatically upon hitting water, but you can also inflate them manually, pulling down on this red toggle to the side. So don't pull down on the red toggle unless you want to inflate. We have a life raft at the back of the boat, as well as two life rings. If you were to see anybody overboard, won't happen today, but you'd shout person overboard straight away. Do not stop looking and pointing at that individual until we've turned around. Have them safely back on board with us. On board, we've got a first aid kit, ether, flares. This is a non-smoking vessel. And if you feel the motion of the ocean today, don't be shy. Let me or Angus know. We can get you a bag, offer you some helpful tips. So we're gonna be leaving through the river mouth. So again, there'll be maybe some impact, some big waves. If there is, brace for that with your knees and your legs instead of your back. If you've got any loose belongings, make sure you secure those. We'll be making quick, fast maneuvers. And then we'll be out to sea and we'll be in whale search mode. <laughs> so um, scan the water, look for the whales coming up to breathe. When they do, they leave behind a big cloud of it. So you'll see that glow maybe a big splash. We're gonna be using this boat as a giant clock today. So the front of the boat is 12, back of the boat six, off to your right three, off to your left nine. So gotta get used to analog, but you know where to look. Say we get out there, we slow to encounter whales, feel free, you can't stand up. Just make sure you always have one hand for the boat, one hand for yourself, two feet on the deck. And then say we've got whales off to the left. This is important so everybody can see. Just ask that those on whale side remain seated so those on the other side can stand up and see, vice versa. Say we've got whales off the bow, they can get quite close. Just ask that those up front remain seated so those at the back can see, and vice versa. But we'll get cruising. Are we excited? Yes! yes. Ready? Any first time whale watchers? the brake wall. We're going to cross the bar. We're going to have a time and have a time. This is my first time to cross in this bar. Unfortunately, the, the swell is not so bad.
largest animals that's ever lived. On average, when they're full grown, they'll get about 15 meters in length. This boat's 12 meters, so they dwarf this boat. And they'll weigh about 40 tons, 40,000 kilos, which is the weight of eight African elephants. Wow. So you may know they're not here year long. Um, just in the winter months, they're migrating along Australia's coastlines. They'll travel up to 10,000 Ks round trip. It's one of the longest migrations of any mammal. Do you know where they spend the summer months when they're not here? Little Queensland. I'm the Great Barrier Reef. This, this time of year, but where are they in the summer when they're not here? Down in the Antarctic. So they're feasting all summer long, eating over a ton of krill a day, a tiny prawn like crustacean. Their mission is to fatten up, bulk up. They build up a really thick blubber layer that they actually survive on in the winter months when they're here and they're fasting. So they don't really eat much when they're here. That's not their priority. Maybe like equivalent of a potato chip a day or a small hamburger meal a day if they get lucky. But for the most part, there's not enough food in the water here for a massive animal like a humpback whale. It's kind of like a barren desert. You see the water in the subtropics. Okay, we've got a blow straight out at three. We'll keep an eye on that. Looks like a cloud of mist. Kind of like four o'clock to us now, a couple hundred meters. So the water is clear and blue, and that's because it's lacking nutrients. Phytoplankton is a tiny marine algae. It makes the water green with the chlorophyll, this green pigment. Not much of it here, that's why the water is blue. And so it's like a barren desert for an animal, especially as large as a humpback. So we've got about four o'clock, one whale up. We'll keep an eye on that. Got more flows up ahead. So we'll just be going through the group that's most surface active, up at the surface. Along. So yeah, not here to feed. Do you know what they're doing here this time of year? Yep, so they're making babies and they're having babies. So this is the breeding season. They're summer feeders, winter breeders. The females that mated last year, they're back to these waters about 11 to 12 months later to give birth. Do you know why? Why not just hang out in the kitchen and binge eat year round? Why do this giant journey? Yeah, warm water. So if they were to give birth to their calves down south, they would quickly freeze to death because these babies are born with a thick insulating fat layer. They have to build that up when they're here. So they'll actually drink about 600 liters of their mother's milk every day at the start. And they'll pack out about 45 kilos each day. So not your skin milk, <laughs> not your 2%. It's about 50% fat and they build up this really thick blubber layer so they can withstand these freezing temperatures. They're actually going to grow in size and double their size within the first year of life. It's the fastest growth rate of any animal. Do you know um, what predator they'd have to worry about as they make their way south to the feeding grounds? Large oceanic sharks, especially in the northern rivers um, area. But as they make their way closer to the Antarctic, there'll be more and more orcas, killer whales. You don't really get them in large numbers in near shore tropical waters because again, not a lot of food here to support a large food chain. So these orcas, they aren't able to store up tons and tons of weight like a humpback. They have to continuously and always feed. So not much food for them. Um, so that's one of the main things driving this migration. There's a lack of predators and um, the warmer water. Do you know the main breeding grounds along Australia's east coast? You said it earlier. Hood. Yep, Great, Great Barrier Reef. Yep, North North Queensland, Bay. Great Barrier Reef. Harvey, Harvey Bay. Bay is a hot spot for females. So of course, if the males are, or the females are preferring that area, the uh, males are going to follow. 
So those are the main breeding grounds. They're gonna hang out there for the longest amount of time. Nobody wants to be too late to the party up that way. So at this time of the season, we've got a northbound migration. They are on a mission, they're heading north and they're going to where they know their chances of meeting up with potential mates is higher, where they tend to congregate and gather. So guys, we're gonna go for a little cruise. Um, we'll go bit into whale search mode, we'll pick up some speed. So keep a lookout. Yeah, definitely have some blows up ahead. Yeah, Sometimes they're pretty elusive. But... Did anybody see dolphins as we were leaving the river? There's two resident Indo Pacific bottlenose dolphin communities. So they're here year round one in Ballina, one up in Byron. They're female dolphin groups, so females with their babies, their dependent calves that will be dependent on them for about four years. But if they're female, they'll stick together for a lifetime. They'll form these really close-knit bonds, especially females with babies of the same age. She's probably not going to get pregnant that same season. She'll have to take care of her baby for a whole year. She's going to be nursing for like at least six months. And it's pretty taxing on the body to get her <coughs> to... Whale on the other side. Oh yeah, further out. Yeah. So that whale would actually be able to hear Oh, look at the big pectoral fin. See that? Yeah, the other Really one. long flipper. And that's kind of like a short distance fall when they slap that fin on the surface. Humpbacks have the longest flipper of any whale. I think that whale's actually belly up. Kind of doing the backstroke, they'll have these giant flippers a third the length of their body. So in a full grown humpback would be maybe five, six meters in length that fin. So it's kind of like a whale wave. Um, they'll slap that on the surface to make more, more noise. Where a breach would be like a long distance call, that pectoral slap will be more of like a short distance call. And again, they're communicating through body language. So usually a relaxed whale, lots of times a flirty whale. Even these females, they'll be pretty flirty. In these whale wars, they might be doing the backstroke, belly up, slapping those flippers side to side exposing themselves at the surface, trying to egg on the boys, round up more boys to the group so she's got more suitors to choose from. Then they're gonna hear that, where guys aren't really wasting time doing the backstroke. Okay, keep a lookout at two. We had a deeper dive from this one. They are gonna fall way too far behind, belly up, slapping their flippers side to side. So a lot of times you get flirty females doing that. They're communicating through body language just like us. But yeah, because the girls aren't available or making babies each season, especially after giving birth, <coughs> and they um, need to head south earlier, they have to make the most of the feeding season. They'll be back a year later giving birth and losing about a third of their weight. So like for a 45 ton female, that's 15 tons she'll lose after giving birth to her baby, producing that really fatty milk, again, 600 liters a day. So she's got to build up more weight so she can afford to lose more weight. So they're not around as long, they're not breeding every year. And that's why we've got all this competition amongst the boys. There's just not enough ladies to go around. This took photos. Oh my oh God! My God. Yes. Oh my goodness! <laughs> With, uh, throughout the day, throughout the night, um, humpbacks are active throughout the day and night. So it's all kind of random out here when they're pairing up or meeting up with other whales. But again, they won't really hang out with the same individuals for like even more than a day. They're really temporary brief oh, associations. That one's doing like a headstand out there. But that's more kind of a relaxed whale. If that was a fluke, they'll have their head down. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're getting all the behaviors from this <laughs> So that's where they get their scientific name. It means big winged New Englander because they look like giant wings. No other whale has flippers that long. So Mega Terra Novaglia. 
Creek Wing to New Englander. Humpbacks were first described back in 1781 by whalers off the New England coast in the Northeast Atlantic. Uh, it's a huge sound. Yeah, yeah, they'll know we're here. So look at their head. It's like the rostrum. They've got these small knobby bumps. Ooh, belly up. So cool, guys. Pretty special to be this close to this action. <laughs> so, so they definitely know we're here. They've got really good vision above and below the surface. Oh, coming over. But they've got these hairs, so they're mammals. All mammals have hair. Well, humpbacks have these tubercles, these bumps on their head. When when this one rolls over, look at the nose, called the rostrum. Each bump is about the size of a golf ball and has a single wiry hair. They're connected to nerves. We think these are kind of like sensory hairs, like whale whiskers. So kind of like antennas, where they would sense things in their surroundings. Okay, super close, guys. Ooh. Whoa. So the vibrations of our engines, sound waves of whale song. Yeah. Oh, now he's or she's facing us, belly to us. <laughs> so that's a female. No, I couldn't see because she's darker oh, on right. the underside. Darker than most Southern Ocean humpbacks, so yeah. Angus took photos. Oh my oh god! My god. Yes. Oh my goodness! <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh my god! There you go. That's like ultimate. We don't get them every trip. Grand slam away on my Okay, keep a lookout. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> really black, this like black belly beauty. We get a lot of white to the underside of Southern Ocean humpbacks. Like almost looks solid white. Their bellies, the underside of their tails. Keep a lookout, guys. The underside of those flippers, a lot lighter than northern hemisphere humpbacks. But that one's got a solid kind of black looking belly, a lot of black on the underside of its tail. All of these whale tails are different, so no two are alike. Kind of like our fingerprints. That is called a blueprint and gonna be their ID. If you get a photo of the underside of that tail, and put it into a, get, a catalog, a database, you can keep track of an individual for a lifetime. So through repeated sightings of whale tails, year to year, that's really how we gain insight into their wildlife. Like we will satellite tag whales, um, or attach like suction recording devices. Oh my goodness, guys, coming to say hello. <gasps> Might be rolling over. I could do a little, Side roll so they can focus in on us with one eye. Oh. <laughs> Got multiple males with a female in heat, a lady. They'll actually physically fight, they'll duke it out, they'll battle for mating rights. And they're going to use their tails and their heads as a formidable weapon. So, definitely a good warning to like back off. That tail throw now is going to make a lot of noise, but if that was with another whale, probably aggressive. Yeah. Especially if you've got like three or more to a group. Um, these. <laughs> okay, so now we've got a deeper dive. Kind of got this pattern here where after the deep dive, he'll do a tail throw. So keep a look out to a pop. But yeah, you'll get these ladies in heat. They're really attracted to the males. And uh, she'll usually have at least one male escort with her. Woohoo! <laughs> Kind of like a creepy stalker boyfriend, a temporary uh -huh. stalker boyfriend. That shadowing her every move and behavior. Even if she breaches, he might breach as a way to court her and impress her. Being active around the female is going to show fitness because you're burning through that precious blubber layer. It's showing that you're fit and also like 
impressing her because she, you're using her energy on her. But he's also sticking really close because if any other male were to join in that group, he's going to start physically defending his position closest to the female, fighting off that other male. So he's kind of like a bodyguard, like a possessive boyfriend. And with time, um, especially, she might try to stir up some trouble and make a whole lot of noise that will round up more boys from the area to the group and kind of egg on and encourage these boys because she wants more options for a mate. So probably not mating with any loser out here this time of year. <laughs> She's got a whole year of pregnancy and she'll take care of her baby for a whole year. So there's a lot invested, big time and energy investment. So that means... Um, her baby will get good genes from a strong, fit father, and that's why we have these boys kind of boasting how big, bad, and tough they are to these girls in heat. Oh. So we'll get these heat run groups where you'll get a female in heat. She's chased by multiple males. It kind of looks like a high-speed car chase, and they'll be jockeying for position closest to her, trying to cut each other off, outmaneuver one another. A lot of it can be non-physical, but it will get physical. They'll try to intimidate. I think we've got another tail throw coming, guys deeper dive, yep. followed by a tail throw. This whale's kind of got a pattern now. So um, it does get physical though. They want to display dominance over one of the bo other boys. They want to intimidate these other boys because they're having to choose their battles wisely. And um, last here without much food. With time, some of these guys will call it quits, tap out. It's just not worth it to stick in the end of the fight if you're not actually going to be able to win over the right to mate with that female. So, oh. it'll go down kind of to one whale left standing, and he's shown how, you know, kind of tough he is to that female, and she will be more likely. Yeah, the dolphins are in spot. They like to ride the nose of the whale and ride in the slipstream. This is all really entertaining for them. Kind of like a one-sided curiosity right now, because... Again, whales, humpbacks have a lot on their mind, more important things, but the dolphins are really playful and like to hang out with them. Kind of like an annoying smaller cousin. <laughs> These dolphins are whales. They're actually tooth whales. Big pet slap, two o'clock. Where humpbacks, they don't have teeth. Instead, they have big giant brush light plates called baleen. They're made out of a thick, tough material called keratin, a protein that our hair and nails are made out of. And so they use this to filter feed. There's that trumpeting association. Kind of like a dog's growl or a lion's roar. Uh, yeah, yeah, they arrive at the social. <laughs> it could be expressing like an emotion, like an emotional wow. shape. A lot of times when the boys are fighting, these brawling, brawling um, bulls will make this the most. A lot of trumpeting. Maybe they're just exhausted and trying to get that fresh breath of air, a recovery breath. Diving down to duke it out and coming up and trying to clear all the air in their lungs, have a nice exchange, but sometimes maybe expressing like agitation, frustration. Again, kind of like a dog's growl or a lion's roar. It's a social sound. All right, we've got this really relaxed tech slapper and a couple right on her tail. So the females are a bit longer about a meter to a meter and a half longer than males so that they can store up extra weight before pregnancy. And they don't tend to have as much scarring. So we've been so close to these humpbacks. You've noticed like white scratches on their backs. That's from physical contact with other whales. They've got razor sharp barnacles on their skin. Ooh, coming in, just getting closer guys. See those light scratches? It looks like they're bleeding but these barnacles have a razor sharp, hard outer shell, so the boys tend to have more scarring because they're duking it out for decades of their life. It's like fighting with brass knuckles. 
tearing into the thick skin of another whale and leave, leaving more battle wounds behind than a female that doesn't do as much fighting. Okay, I think that one was kind of crossing, heading towards our six o'clock last, but they're all over the place. So just one in there. Keep a lookout. That's like kind of doing headstands, belly up, rolling over. They are solo. They're not with a potential mate. They might be a bit more relaxed and curious. Or even courting pairs. When a male's got like a female on his own, he's more relaxed than in a heat run group. So he, they, as together as a pair, um, might be a bit flirty and interactive with the boats. Just kind of depends on the social group and the whale. We've got a lot of young whales here, lots of juveniles. So I think keep our, keep a lookout other side of the boat too. I think our white whale walked over. Lots of action off about one o'clock. So we got to get a lot of young whales after separate, separating from their mothers. One year of life, um, these uh, babies, these yearlings, will actually come back to the waters they were yeah. where they were born. Do you guys know how many whales travel the East Coast now? How many humpbacks? Okay, guys, we'll go check out this group. There's definitely some activity up ahead. Maybe even some flirty female action with this pectoral slapping. She's got some too. whales on her tail, and you do get some challengers around. They might be joining and up with her See? So yeah, there's 40,000 or more whales this year um, on this humpback highway. And And every year we see the population growing about 10 to 11 percent. So last year there were thousands of babies born, like maybe up to 4,000. And all of those calves come back as juveniles the following year. They might not reach maturity. Usually it's around six years of age, but they've got a lot to learn out here. Like, you'll get these young, rowdy, rambunctious young males that'll like play fight with one another, kind of how we like wrestle as toddlers. Well, they're gonna need to learn how to fight and compete for females one day. That'll be really crucial to their future reproductive success. A little common dolphin coming over at three o'clock. reproductive success. So they've got to learn how to sing a song, how to flirt, how to court individuals, how to just find the breeding grounds and travel and find the breeding grounds. Everything really will come into play. Whoa guys, this is a whole lot of action. That breacher was last up at two o'clock. So keep an eye out. Oh, I see bright blue right here at one. Super close. Coming up 12 o'clock. That's the okay. light underside of that clipper. Oh. Oh. Four. 
Yeah. We might hear them before we see them. Oh! Six o'clock. going on right now and kind of milling around so they'll be changing direction pretty quickly and they're a bit erratic so it's hard to predict where they'll be up with that peck slapper coming up at four o'clock see oh, wow. oh my goodness don't know where to look four o'clock <laughs> that peck slapper is going for a day. The female dolphin groups are females with their dependent calves. So the females stick together, you get multi-generations in the mix. The males break off from their mothers around four to eight years of age when they're independent. And they'll form alliances with like two to three other males and alliances with other alliances. They have relationships just as complex as our own. So we got Peck Slapper at one, this whale coming in at about seven o'clock. So these dolphins, they'll remember if you stole their girlfriend or treated their mother or grandmother nicely or did them a favor. They have like full on politics, just like us. So. <laughs> The females, like I said, they form really close bonds with the, uh, other females with babies of the same age and even exchange babysitting duties. And the reason they've evolved to be so smart is to keep up with the intricacies of these thriving social lives. They have to keep track of, oh, we hear, wow, of hundreds of individuals in this broader community. So peck slapping at 11, so there's about a thousand individuals of Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphins that use the area throughout the year. But a smaller portion of those are residents. So there's about 35 in the Valena River, that community. And they like to rest outside the river mouth. They have their favorite resting and hunting grounds. So this whole coastline is great for feeding. They're pretty spoiled. Some of the richest hunting grounds on the continent here because we got the northern rivers feeding out to sea enriching our water so they've got a lot of bait fish and fish in this area so they're probably doing a bit of feeding out here but they love to hang out with the humpbacks again it's like a entertaining larger cousin for them <laughs> and then byron's got its own community wadagos beach like if you go to the lighthouse and you see dolphins there going to be our Byron community of about a hundred or so dolphins that stick here year round. So look out for a baby on board because they give birth throughout the entire year. Late summer, early autumn when the water's warmest is kind of peak of the birthing season for these dolphins. And they'll have about a year of pregnancy too. Okay, footprints at about eight. Look out, maybe 10 or so. and then trap tiny, tiny food like plankton and krill inside, or small schooling fish. The largest animals that have ever graced our planet are eating the tiniest of things because they have very small throats. A humpback's throat is only about as round as a grapefruit. So they could fit a whole car in their mouth, but they wouldn't even be able to get us or even like a larger tuna down into their belly because they don't have teeth. They're not breaking apart food either. They swallow everything whole. So. Eating the tiniest thing of things like plankton, krill, small schooling fish, they'll just eat tons of it a day. Like blue whales, their heart's about the size of a Volkswagen bug. A uh, humpback's heart weighs about 200 kilos, but still very tiny throats, so. Yeah, so they, they really just feed on um, small schooling fish. And they um, eat on krill. That is hard as well. Yeah, so that if they accidentally get like a larger item in their mouth, maybe because they're like lunge feeding, and you might notice, uh, I know from documentaries, okay, we're getting close to this group. 
They do this bubble net fishing or feeding sometimes. They do this for small schooling fish in the northern hemisphere, but also down in the Antarctic on the trail. So you'll get a group of humpbacks come together. One humpback will be the bubble specialist, dive down really deep and blow a bubble ring. Swim around in a V-shaped spiral, release air to the bubble holes. These big bubbles will expand as they get closer to the surface. And then the other humpbacks are making really high pitch noises to scare and panic this prey and trail them into a tight concentration. And then the vocalist to that group will wind up in synchronization and take it all into their body. So together, they feed. And some females that actually have been re-excited get the same females and the same exact parts of the world. Kind of like a friend reunion. And how we come together on the holidays to feast our families. We see how that's rejoining like this. on their own too. So swarms of krill can sometimes be seen from space in certain parts of the year. So they'll just pick up speed to a giant one with an open mouth and take it all this krill in water. Yeah, a that weighs over a ton. You probably have heard of like these orcas of Eden down in South Wales. Oh, they used to help whalers. Again, that's most, one of the most invaluable things you can collect on a whale because it's a forever ID. Tags will come off with time, but you can keep track of, of an individual with these whale tail photos. Well, over 40% of those have orca teeth marks on the underside for humpbacks worldwide. So these predations definitely are happening, but it's so incredibly rare to encounter. So we were even just completely caught off guard back in 2019. A mother, calf, and a male escort, and creepy stalker boyfriend. Some of these ladies will go into heat after giving birth, and they'll be, you know, followed by this stalker boyfriend that'll linger around long enough to see if she's receptive and keen. If not, he'll move on to another single pretty lady. He can't waste much time on it. They would just starve. But now that we've got thousands of babies born each year, we've got a reliable, dependable food source, and there's pretty good incentive to travel all this way. And um, now they've got this, this, this prey, all these baby humpbacks heading south with their mothers. Kind of the prime time for that is later on in the season. Like lactating females, they show up last. And so again, the babies need about at least four to six weeks here after birth to build up that weight and that strength to survive potential orca attacks. It's a careless path place with these orcas so um, they're on the workout program here and up for this trip. Where did they come from? The program on the way down. So usually they're like down um, off like the south coast in Tasmania. The, um, it really didn't take them long to do it that day. It had, again, never been actually filmed or documented. So we learned a lot, like the male escort that we would think would kind of stick around and help us was mother and calf in trouble, but he was just in action from the start. Well, facts have even risked their own lives to save sea lions. Okay, coming up at 8 o'clock. And literally defended like different species like sea lions from the world up in the North Pacific. That's what it is. But this male escort probably realized it was both the sea and the MIA. So, um, the humpback has a powerful muscle, it's its tail. So it's tail curling, like we came across that one earlier. Yeah. That's what we saw, um, even this mother and calf, that's like the first move a mother humpback would teach a baby, how to tail curl. But they kind of hug the side of our boat. The first order of business is to separate the mother and calf. 
And then once they were isolated by like a couple hundred meters within minutes, some workers were on the bomb, but most of them were ganging up on that baby. And the same kind of hunting strategies that were described back in the work of the days are what we observed. All right, come it up guys. So some were controlling the outskirt, like there was this really big nail with a commercial fin, quite tall, like they could get up to two meters of height those doors like this. Okay. He was on the outskirts, preventing the baby from escaping a confined area. Others others were down at a depth, like these females were down for a longer time, preventing the baby from swimming down in this tank. And then others would jump over the baby's back, cover the blowholes, prevent that whale from breathing and biting at its back. So they all have a designated role, workers are assassins of the sea. Like, you know, they don't know the best way to go after whatever they're hunting. Um, for baby whales, they really have to build up their breath pool to get bit. And whales, when they jump and when they're active, they build up protein in their muscle and blood. And they fill like these red blood cells with oxygen. And so they can hold down, hold up longer down times, like after breaching. So baby whales will breach over and over and over. It looks quite grateful. But not only is mom encouraging this building up the strength of that tail muscle that'll use as a weapon, but they're building up their breath hold. They really can only hold their breath for maybe like three minutes, three to five minutes at the start. And then they'll build that up traveling by the eyes of holes and surfacing that frequently, it would take forever. And mom's pretty angry. She's eager to get south to the feeding grounds. Not gonna leave prematurely though. And I'll go. So 100 years, maybe even longer. But um, also, the baby is going to stay down longer. And these orcas that try to hold the baby down past the breath hold and drown them aren't going to have as much luck with like a stronger, fitter cat that can stay down longer. So, you know, like, yeah, yeah, they might be die of old age. See those stretchy groups? Right by the curve of the mouth, you'll see the eye. So our whale with this whale, see the eye right above that thing? It's about the size of a baseball. So they can die like of sickness and disease. They can die from like injuries. Can they die of starvation? So they can um, pretty much start die of starvation if they're not able to get down to yeah. Sometimes they're still not this way, like babies. They might be abandoned for them by mothers. We don't know why necessarily, but maybe it wasn't going to survive the journey and she decided it wasn't worth it to focus on a baby. But um, yeah, old age or you know, sickness, just like us, they could die out to sea. Yeah. And this is actually one of the ways whales contribute to the health of our oceans. See the eye with that brown bone just to the bit back. So, humpbacks feed on plankton that are at the surface of the water. The plankton, they go to the synthesize sunlight. So they make food out of the sun, light, and um, phytoplankton has carbon, lots of carbon. So, that'll be like 100 meters in length, like a giant um, fertilizer to the sea, kind of like the newer. So when there weren't as many whales back in the day, there wasn't this one.